So this problem would be challenging as it is, but add to it the fact that our data is noisy and of high dimension. And we need to be able to predict the word a person is thinking of using just one single noisy trial. So we have MEG recordings of two subjects in the MEG scanner viewing 20 different words. The words fall into four word categories, animals, food, tools, and buildings. For each of the 20 words, we have 20 single trials um, for a total of 400 single trials. We're going to use 15 of the single trials from each word to build a word model, and we'll use the remaining five for testing. Oh, so three quarters train, one quarter test. So you might be familiar with fMRI. fMRI measures the um, blood oxygenation in response to increased cognitive load. Uh, fMRI has great spatial resolution, but really poor time resolution. You get about one sample every two seconds. MEG, on the other hand, records the magnetic field caused by neurons firing. So it has great temporal resolution. We can sample up to 1,000 times a second, but it comes at the cost of reduced spatial resolution. But because it takes you less than a second to read a word, we're going to trade off spatial resolution for time resolution so that we can see the process of you reading and understanding a word. So a mag machine is 102 sensors in a helmet. And this helmet is actually really big. It's so big that you don't put on the helmet, the helmet puts on you. Um, so you're sitting in the helmet, and out comes 102 time series of uh, the activity of your neurons as you read the words. This is a view of the helmet from above. So the front, the nose, the nose of the patient is represented by the black triangle. So the top of the picture is the front of the head, and the bottom of the picture is the back of the head. And we talk about meg one meg recording for the word W and the single trial I at time T. We're talking about a vector Y sub T superscript I comma W. This is a vector of dimension 102. So I want to um, show you how noisy meg data is. So we're going to look at a single trial from a single sensor, all for the same word, cat. So this is one of the single trials. This is another single trial for the same person viewing the same word and the same sensor. And this is all 15 of the trials that we're going to be trying to train with. So you can see the noise scenario is very high. This is the MLE estimate of the mean of these uh, single trials. And this blue line is the estimate that we get out of the model that I'll be describing today. So the blue line you can see is close to the MLE. It, it is a little smoother. Also, I want to point out that um, so zero, I, I know the axis is small, but time is long. The x-axis and zero is the onset of the stimuli, so the moment that the word comes on the screen. And you can see the strong physiological response just afterwards, so the, the dip down. And that's because the sensor is in the occipital lobe. Uh, so it's a very strong physiological response. So this is actually one of the cleaner responses amongst the sensors. So I've touched on some of these, but I just want to enumerate the challenges that we have with this data. It's noisy. It's of high dimension. The covariance of the sensors changes over time. That is, as the brain areas begin to talk to each other in different patterns, the relationship between the sensors and their readings is going to change. And there's also trial-to-trial -trial variation. So even if it's the same person, the same word, and the same sensor, the recorded signal can look very different. So we'll go through these challenges one by one and talk about how the model addresses those challenges. So the first challenge is that MEG data is noisy. Traditionally, the way people deal with this challenge is by just getting a lot of repetitions of the same word and averaging them together. This assumes that the channels are independent. Um, and the question we're trying to answer is whether you can do better than just taking the average. So the observation we use to tackle this problem is the fact that the underlying signal is smooth. So in order for the MEG machine to pick up your brain activation pattern, you need at least 50,000 neurons firing at the same time in the same direction. And so what we're actually capturing is a, some sort of population average of neural activity. And so if we could record it in a noise-free scenario, the recorded signal would be smooth. For that reason, we're going to use a Gaussian process, a set of Gaussian processes to model the neural response. Uh, this is review, I'm sure, but a Gaussian process is a distribution, um, a draw from a distribution defined completely by a mean function m and a kernel function c, which defines the covariance. Uh, for this work, we used a square exponential kernel. 
uh, Gaussian process has the property that uh, time points in, on the, along the function are jointly Gaussian with mean defined by the mean function and covariance between the points up within time defined by the kernel function. So when the covariance is high, um, nearby time points are highly correlated and so the resulting function is smooth. When covariance is low, the resulting function is uh, less smooth. The mean function can be something similar like a lim linear function, in which case the Gaussian processes would uh, follow the linear trend. <laughs> but it can also be something more complicated, like itself a Gaussian process draw, in which case the uh, Gaussian processes would center around that function. So I'm jumping a little ahead here, but um, I'm going to be talking about a hierarchy of latent processes. And this hierarchy is such that the parent um, forms the mean that we'll use to draw each of the children. So the children are centered around the mean parent latent process. Okay. The second challenge is that the data is of high dimension. So we have 102 sensors, 340 time points, and 15 single trials. So in order to deal with this challenge, we observe that the sensors are redundant. So there's a lot of uh, relationship between sensors uh, that are close together in space, as well as some uh, farther reaching correlations between sensors that are over areas of the brain that talk to each other. So to prove this to you, here are two sensors over time. The blue and the green sensors are close to each other, and the red and the cyan sensors are close to each other, and you can see that there's redundancy in the signal that they're capturing. So in order to take advantage of the fact that what we actually have is a process evolving in a lower dimensional space, um, we're going to do something uh, called factor analysis, where we take the meg, we say that the meg signal at time t is actually a function of a factor loading matrix, which takes a, a process in a lower dimensional space and casts it up into the full dimensional space. So the meg signal at time t is a vector of p dimension, and a factor loading matrix uh, is a matrix of p by k, where k is much smaller than p. Uh, so we have our latent processes evolving in a lower dimensional space, and we're going to use our factor loading matrix. Uh, we're going to add noise to these lower dimensional uh, Gaussian processes and then use the factor loading matrix to project them up into the full dimensional space, from which we'll observe our final MEG signal. So the MEG signal y sub t is uh, lambda times eta, which is the latent processes plus noise, plus another additional noise factor independent. <coughs> the third challenge is that the coordination changes with time. That is, the model is heteroscedastic. Um, so instead of having one uh, loading matrix that projects the data from the lower dimension up to the full dimension consistently across time, uh, what we need is a factor loading matrix that is itself a function of time that changes as time marches along. And so at each point of time, we'll have a different factor loading matrix um, to project the lower dimensional processes up into the full dimensional space of the MEG data. So this is the full formulation of the model. We have our MEG data Y sub T. We're saying that it's a, um, a function of this latent mean plus some noise. So, so we have eta here and eta here. We're saying that lambda is what takes our eta and projects it up into the full high dimensional space. So we already know that um, psi are latent processes, are uh, Gaussian processes, but now we're introducing a new Gaussian process, C, um, which causes lambda, the factor loading matrix, to become a function of time. So now, under this model, the covariance is lambda times lambda prime. Um, and so it's because it is incorporated C, which is a function of time, uh, a matrix of Gaussian processes. This makes the model heteroscedastic. So uh, lambda at time t is theta times C at time t. We're going to put a shrinkage prior on the columns of theta so that we encourage the model to use as few of the Gaussian processes in C as possible to fit the data. Uh, and this um, believes us of the burden of having to set k. We can set it to a level that we think is large, and then the model will uh, shrink the theta matrix to use the right number of uh, Gaussian processes. 
The fourth challenge is that there's a lot of trial to trial variability. So even though, so the observation we use to deal with this is the fact that although each time we view the MEG data it looks different, what we're actually observing is some true core brain activation associated with the idea of thinking of a word. And each one of these um, trials is some variation from that true process. So we need our model to allow for multiple examples. In addition, we need the flexibility to allow each one of these examples to deviate somewhat from the true processes of the brain activation. So this is the model as we've described it so far. We have our latent processes evolving in a lower dimensional space and we're projecting them back up with a factor loading matrix lambda that depends on T. And so now to this, we're gonna add a hierarchy of latent processes. So we have a parent latent process that will form the mean of the single trial latent process. And we'll take the single trial latent process and project it up into the full dimensional space of the MEG data using the time bearing factor loading matrix lambda. So this hierarchy allows us to share information between the single trials. So in the way that the, um, each child can influence the parent when we sample and, each, uh, and the parent in turn influences the children. So the children are communicating information between the parent To give you a sense of what this looks like in practice, uh, this is some of the data for uh, one of the single trials for a particular word in a particular sensor. So the green line is a single trial, and for just for interest's sake, I've included a kernel smooth version of that single trial, which is the red dashed line. Um, the cyan line is the parent latent process, and the uh, dark blue line is the child latent process. So you can see in this case, the single trial deviated quite a lot from the parent latent process. Um, so the child is somewhere between what the parent is modeling and what the single trial has shown. Well, I did want to point out that there is this, there's this strong dip here that actually didn't show up much in the single trial, but it shows up in the child latent process because it's in the parent. So you can see some of this information being transferred between the child and the uh, parent. So here's another case. In this case, we have a uh, single trial that's actually closer to the mean and so the child latent process is actually uh, closer to the single trial than it is to the parent. So a generative story, we've, we've covered the model in full at this point and I just want to walk through the generative story to make clear how it fits together. So we have some person viewing a word. When they view that word we've chosen the word model and so we've selected the parent latent process that governs the brain activity for viewing this word. From that, we draw a child latent process that allows some innovation on top of the parent latent process. We take our time varying factor loading matrix, lambda, which is the product of theta and xi, and we use lambda to project this lower dimensional single trial that we've sampled up into the full dimensional space. And so those purple dots are actually the MEG data that we're actually observing. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about evaluation now, but first, uh, recall what we're trying to do. We're trying to be able to distinguish between four word categories. We've trained on 15 single trials and we've withheld five trials for testing. So there are 20 independent word models here, each trained with 15 single trials. Uh, so this is the Gibbs sampler. Uh, so do you think you could like walk through this step by step? Just kidding, I won't make you do that. Um, but I did want to point out that uh, what we're, what we're doing, although the model might look complicated, what we're doing is just sampling from Gaussian, so it's actually not um, too bad. And so in the end, what we actually want to calculate is the probability of a new single trial Y star, given the training data. Um, so what we're gonna do is use the Gibbs samples that come from our uh, Gibbs sampling the later in the chain once we've converged. And for each one of the parameters that was sampled for that iteration, we're going to draw a child latent process size star that's centered around the parent latent process that was sampled for that iteration and evaluate the probability of our new single trial given that uh, parameterization. 
So we're going to compare against a couple of other model formulations. First, we have a homoscedastic model. So this, we estimate the mean of the 102 sensors independently using an MLE, so just taking the average of the 15 single trials, and estimate the covariance, a static covariance matrix using the full time course. Then we have a heteroscedastic model, which incorporates the same mean uh, estimated for the 102 sensors in, independently. But now we're going to use a shifting window to uh, estimate a time varying covariance matrix. And our model is a mean that depends on this child latent process centered around the parent and the factor loading matrix lambda and a covariance matrix that's a function of time that depends on lambda. So in the end, what we're going to do is choose the word category for the word that maximizes the likelihood of each of, of the model given of the, sorry, of the single trial given the model parameters. In addition, I'm also going to compare to an SVM just to see how a discriminative method might work also under these situations. So we're going to look at results. I want to make clear before we look at the results that what we're dealing with here is incredibly noisy data. Uh, it's a notoriously hard problem. Um, and so you're, the, the precision numbers are not mind-blowing, but they're, you know, better than what we're comparing against. Oh, I've broken. Now I've ruined the punchline. Oh, well. OK. So here are the, um, these are binomial confidence thresholds. So P.05 is 33% and P.01 is 36%. And so a, heteros a homoscedastic model that does not have any um, variation in the covariance matrix fails to perform above chance for both of our subjects. When we incorporate a time varying covariance matrix, we end up with uh, just above threshold performance for subject one, but not subject two. Our method exceeds the 0.05 sub threshold for both subjects and the P.01 threshold for subject one. And an SVM, a linear SVM, um, performs below the P.05 threshold for subject two, but above it for subject one. But recall that we, are, we still beat the SVM in both cases. Uh, okay, so this is a video of the posterior cor correlation between each of the sensors and the star sensor. And on the right-hand side, we have the word house, and the left-hand side, we have the word hammer. So we're going to watch the, co the correlation evolve in time. Uh, and you'll see that the word house has some strong uh, negative correlation with the frontal lobe that's at the top of the screen. Uh, and the sensor at the beginning, but then as time evolves, um, hammer is really the one with the most uh, negative correlation, and it goes through these waves. And you'll be able to see a strong difference between the two correlations. So there's a strong wave of negative correlation. So I want to point out also that this model has no idea about the layout of the sensors that wasn't incorporated at all into the model. So all of the spatial smoothness you're seeing here is learned. OK, good. So to summarize, uh, we built a heteroscedastic model that incorporates a hierarchy of latent processes in order to deal with data that's highly noisy, of high dimension, and is uh, recording a process whose correlation is changing over time and with high variability between recordings. In the future, I think we could extend the hierarchy to incorporate information between words within the same category, word category, as well as all words or across subjects. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yeah, so there's several differences. Is that where you're going? There's several differences yeah. between that model and this. First of all, it's a completely different recording mechanism. That's FMI. Oh, it's, FMI. it's also the average over several trials. Okay. And so this is single trial recording. Okay, so this is just a harder problem. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so you've got this sort of layer of Gaussian processes with the child process <coughs> and the parent process, but the parent process is individual to a person still, isn't it? Yeah, it is. You're not Trying to share information between people. No, I think it's not sensible to. I, I, I don't so, know. So, well, 
So I think in theory it is sensible. I think we would probably, I'm working right now in sensor space, so I haven't actually transformed the data from the sensor locations to project it onto like a brain map. And in order to share data across subjects, we'd have to do that. Which is not to say that it couldn't be done, but I do think that that would be interesting and I think probably could improve performance. Although um, computationally, the Gibbs sampler would. Although it's probably not appropriate in the MEG application dealing with it, um, is there a, a way that you could utilize this in an online fashion um, for other kind of uh, changing domains and uh, so that would be the final goal. And I think, yeah, in MEG it's not like you can strap an MEG to somebody's head like in the airport. Um, but so, and as it stands now, this model is actually kind of computationally intensive to um, evaluate. So this as it stands wouldn't be feasible, but I think in general that is sort of like the end goal. And that's why we would like to do single trial classification so that we could do online. Yeah, so uh, the problem with, so Meg data is um, hard to record because it actually requires a human to sit in the Meg machine. And they don't like to sit still for very long, so we sort of have an upper bound on the number of single trials we can capture. But I think, uh, like was suggested before, if we could combine data across subjects, then we could start to deal with that problem that people, it's just hard to put people in a Meg scanner for more than an hour. Okay, let's thank people all That's right. Gaussian processes for spatial temporal modeling, and this is joint work with Alexander Ilin. So, to begin with the problem setting, so we have an unknown spatial temporal field which is a function of location and time, and we would like to learn this field from a set of noisy observations. And now, the requirement for the input set is that we have a set of locations and a set of time instances, which don't need to be evenly spaced or anything, but at each time instance we get observations from that set of locations. So the input set is a Cartesian product of the locations and the time instances. We can have missing values, but this is like the baseline. Um, so in order to model the functions, we use custom processes, which make it possible to set the distributions over the functions and they are characterized by a mean function and a 
covariance function and you can draw samples from it also. And the problem with Gaussian processes is that the computations scale cubically with respect to the number of data points. And um, there are roughly two different approaches. Maybe you can, if the function is a long scale function, you can use, for example, low rank approximations of the covariance matrix. If the function is a short scale, you can use, for example, compactly supported covariance functions. So the covariance matrix will be sparse and you can utilize sparse matrix algorithms to gain some speed. And so we're now interested in this short scale phenomena. And so the covariance matrices that follow, you can assume that they are sparse. <clears throat> so we begin with a very simple model where the covariance function is separable, means that the overall covariance is a product of a covariance over the spatial domain and a covariance over the temporal domain. And given that the input set was a Cartesian product, this results in a covariance matrix which is a Kronecker product. And this Kronecker product has nice properties. For example, if we don't compute the full covariance matrix explicitly, the memory requirements are reduced significantly because we can just store two small matrices, the temporal covariance matrix and the spatial covariance matrix. And uh, we can do some operations like a Kolesky decomposition. We can do it separately in the temporal domain and the spatial domain and then just combine the results. And the same applies to inverting the matrix, just inverting both mm -hmm. do domains separately. So it's very efficient to deal with these much smaller matrices than the full matrix. <coughs> and also uh, matrix vector multiplication is also very efficient. But <coughs> now I'd like to construct a bit more complex covariance. So this is the Kronecker product covariance matrix that we had before. And now first we add some noise to get model some realistic observations and then uh, also we might have missing values so we need to remove those rows and columns from the covariance matrix which correspond to the missing values and this can be done with a matrix operation where this i tilde is a identity matrix where you remove the rows corresponding to the missing values and then if you want to model uh, different length scales or something, then we can have a set of these covariance matrices and by having a sum. And uh, again, if we don't compute explicitly the covariance matrix, then the memory requirement is reduced significantly. And uh, so we can just like store the building blocks. But now the Kolesky decomposition and inversion we cannot do them efficiently. The, it would require computing the full covariance matrix and we don't want to do that. But still, fortunately, this matrix vector operation is very efficient because the covariance matrix was built as, a, as matrix operations. We can just apply the matrix operations sequentially to the vector. So, so those operations are efficient. So, how to do inference with the model that we introduced? So, the, one of the standard ways would be to integrate out the function values and then learn the hyperparameters by drawing samples from the marginal posterior or maybe optimizing it. And, uh, well, that's the density function. Um, and then how to learn the function values can uh, for example, compute the mean and the variances of the function values, maybe the diagonal elements of that covariance matrix. That would be the standard approach, usually. But now that the Kolesky decomposition is computationally too expensive, we cannot 
compute the log determinant of the covariance matrix. And then, but the <coughs> function values, we could compute the mean by using some iterative methods to solve the matrix vector system. But, but to compute the variances, would, it would be too expensive to solve that matrix system. So we propose to use Gibbs sampling instead. <coughs> so draw samples from the conditional posterior distributions in terms the function values and the hyperparameters. And now the question is how to draw samples from these conditional distributions efficiently. And then in Gibbs sampling you might have strong coupling between the parameters of the variables and in order to the KIP sample to work well, you need to reduce that coupling somehow. So these are the questions that now need to be solved. And uh, for the function values, <coughs> we can do this kind of sampling. We first draw samples from the prior, and then we transform the samples from the prior. And actually, that is a uh, sample from the posterior. So. So, in a bit more detail, we first draw samples from the generative process, the function values and the data. And uh, then we use that transformation, given the data, and then given these F tilde and Y tilde samples from the prior. And if you compute the mean and the covariance of that transformation, you see that the, it has the correct moments. So, so this, in general, applies to Gaussian distributions. You can draw samples from the posterior like this. If these two steps are efficient to do, then it's a good way. And now, in our case, this generative process, sampling from the prior, that's very efficient because the prior covariance matrices have Kronecker product structure. So it's easy to generate the data. And um, the transformation is also efficient. It's just uh, need to solve matrix vector system, and uh, you can use conjugate gradient method for that, for example. Then how about sampling the hyperparameters? Well, the conditional density function is cheap to compute. There's no problem with that, but the main problem is that these hyperparameters and function values are strongly coupled. In Gaussian processes, there's a strong structure in the prior. So if you have a lot of function values given, then the distribution of the hyperparameters is almost like a delta distribution. So we need to reduce that coupling somehow. And we'll do a change of variables. So we we want to make this transformed z as independent of theta as possible by this linear transformation. And uh, ideally, this would widen the posterior distribution, in which case z and theta would be independent, and uh, the Gibbs sampler would be very efficient. But of course, we cannot compute the posterior covariance matrix, so we cannot widen the Posterior. But because in Gaussian processes there's a lot of structure already in the prior, maybe if we widen the prior distribution already helps enough. So and the prior distributions are again easy to compute and we can widen the prior distributions. So let's see how well this works. Now here's a comparison between the standard using like the marginal posterior and the Koleski decomposition approach and then using this skip sampler. So the red line is the standard approach and the blue line is the skip sampler. And because there is a high autocorrelation between the between the samples, especially in the Gibbs sampler case, um, we compute the Num effective number of samples <coughs> and uh, we show the CPU time 
for one effectively independent sample. So in the x-axis is the number of data points and then y-axis is the how much time it required. So by comparing the solid lines, the amount of time for the effectively in the independent samples, this GIP sampler was approximately maybe 100 times faster. And uh, the memory requirements also limited the size of the data sets. So this, this marginal posterior could be used only for something like maybe 50,000 data points. Whereas this GIP sampler could be used for 10 million observations in, in this setup. So then a real world experiment. So we had a global sea surface temperature data. We have uh, 1700 locations over the globe, 1600 time instances. Uh, but we have approximately half of the data is missing. Especially in the early years, the amount of missing data is significant. And so in total we have 1.3 million observations, which is quite a lot for Gaussian process regression. And the goal is now to reconstruct the missing values. But of course we don't have the missing values because they are missing, so we need to use test sets. And uh, we use two kinds of test sets. The first case is such that we <coughs> pick data points randomly with probability 0.2. The problem with this approach is that the test points tend to be very close to other observations. So using this short scale method, it might be too easy to reconstruct. And uh, so we try to make the setup a bit more realistic. We use the pattern of missing data from the early years, where we have lots of missing data. We use that pattern. And uh, in the recent years, we have lots of data. So we use that missing value pattern to remove data from the recent years. So we have the same missing value pattern than we have in the real case. So that should somehow simulate the real problem. And um, we compare it to principal component analysis and then to Gaussian process factor analysis, uh, which is basically just PCA, but you put Gaussian process priors over the factors. So for the uniform case, uh, we had uh, yeah we had two short scale Gaussian processes. The first one used only one covariance function, like one length scale. The other one was a sum of two covariance functions, modeling two different length scales. So for the uniform test set. Uh, these short scale GPs had a smaller reconstruction errors, but there was no difference between these two short scale GPs. For the, like interestingly, for this pattern case, pattern test set, these short scale GPs also performed best. And there you can even see the that adding another covariance function so that you're able to model two different length scales then improves the results. And uh, okay, so that's it. Summarized. So I presented a spatial temporal Gaussian process model for short scale modeling. It had a non separable covariance function and uh, presented a Bayesian inference method which draws samples of the hyperparameters and the function values and it was applicable to very large spatial temporal data sets. Okay, that's it. Thank you.
Okay, we've got questions. What was the data source for this service Um, it's, I think the, it's MOH SST, M-O-H SST, I'm not sure about, I don't remember, it's in the paper at least, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, why we model so short scale? Yeah. So, okay, well, so for these long scale phenomena, there are these you can use um, inducing inputs approach, for example, or then this Gaussian process factor analysis. They are good for modeling the long scale or global phenomena, but this. Um, but they usually aren't sufficient, so you might want to model also the short scale. So now this is the short scale. You might want to combine it with the long scale model, so you're able to model both long scale and short scale phenomena. But, yeah. So it seems like, at least based on the graphic you're showing there, it seems like almost, basically no smoothness, like almost no smoothness going on. Is that, is that what you're... Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get it. So it seems like all those no smoothing is occurring in the short scale case. Like, the GP is just sort of going, like, drawing lines between successive data points. So yeah, like, yeah, okay, true. Sure, that's not a very good... Just sort of a feature of that graph and not the general case? So yeah, it's a more feature of this. They might be more noisy, yeah. If I put more noise, then maybe you wouldn't see anything. So, but yeah. yeah, at least in this uh, sea surface temperature data, they are very noisy. So you can see the smoothening. Yeah. Uh, so your regression uh, was the experiments show that the GP mean is really good, but do you have an idea of how well the variance is? Um, thinking whether I computed some um, measures for that. I don't have a definite answer for that now. But yeah, it's, I think it's a good question too. You should really like see the distribution, not just the mean. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker. See something? So I can't see it.
the speaker is Brent Kerry. Thank you very much for the opportunity to give the very last talk of this conference. So this is joint work with Paul, Jan, Duncan, Frank and Klaus from the TU Berlin. And uh, so I'll be talking about regression for sets of polynomial equations. I will examine slide 15 what this title means. And uh, so actually this paper is a random sample. So um, I and Paul met at the Institute of Oberwolfach where uh, the seats at the dinner are randomized and that's at the, basically at the origin of our paper. Uh, that was four years ago, so let's see. Um, so basically this is, um, in my talk, I will talk about how you can use approximate algebraic methods to solve machine learning problems. And of course, I could have done this now in maximum generality and minimum usability, but uh, judging by the looks on your faces, it's probably uh, for the best that I decided to start with uh, some intuitive example. And uh, um, well, hopefully you will grasp the ideas I so we used in our paper. So as an example, let us consider sort of a marginalization problem which is related to LDA. So we start with uh, n real random variables in big D space, or you can think of it, we start with samples from them. And now we want to determine a uh, projection such that um, for those data sets sampled from these random variables, they look similar. So in um, difference to LDA, where we are looking for a projection, which makes them look uh, um, most discriminative, we are now looking for a projection which makes those uh, classes, or the samples from those LDA random variables um, uh, so similar as it is possible. Okay, and on this example, I will demonstrate how um, with some algebraic um, tricks, you can construct um, an estimator to solve this problem. But uh, first things first. So let us again look at the simplest instance of the marginalization problem as something interesting happens. So um, let's assume that they are Gaussian and centered, the means are zero. So we can think of those distributions in terms of their covariances, which I have depicted here. And the projection we are looking for, um, is, this is P, and the projected covariances are this black line. So covariances just transform linearly. So that's what we're looking for. And of course, um, in order to do something which makes sense, we will make the generative assumption that P exists, so just to be correct here. Okay, so what's now the standard way of tackling this problem? You would write down a loss function, right? So one possible loss function to write down here would be this one. So it's uh, normalized for not running to infinity and these are just the differences of the projections. And you can come up with hundreds of other loss functions, you can uh, come, come up with sophisticated loss functions involving some noise model, uh, kullback leibler divergences or uh, whatever. But let's look at this loss function. So if you write down this loss function, you will see you have a minimum, a global minimum at the true solution, and a local minimum at the uh, so there's Boolean's local minimum, which corresponds to this projection. And of course, you all know this is a general phenomenon in machine learning. Whenever you do optimization, which is non-convex, you have uh, local minima and you have many of them. So in this projection example, you would have O of uh, two to the dimension of those local minima and uh, it's bad. So you have to reinitialize, you lose resources, you run into local minima and um, that's bad. So now, in this example, we can also do something with algebra. So um, algebra basically 
is about relations. So do we have any relations in this example? Yes. I mean, we put those relations in the loss function, but then the loss function somehow forget about those relations. So the solution is uniquely characterized by those two equations. So the, the loss function mirrors that, but in, in fact, we can uniquely solve those two equations. So if we have a way to solve those two equations, then we can just get immediately to the global minimum. <coughs> so more general, if you have small d and big D, then there are these equations. The set of solutions is an algebraic set, which also has some symmetry structure. So for example, if you multiply a matrix from the left to the solution, um, then it's another solution and this holds for any solution, so there's some structure in this set. And this is, I think, also a common phenomenon in machine learning. So for example, whenever you do some projection pursuit, you have this kind of symmetries. So I will try to give the idea how one can, in this example, and in more general, as described in our paper, use techniques, computational techniques from algebraic geometry um, to exploit the structure. So now a short um, theoretical intermezzo. So on this slide, I will give some definitions, and they are the only definitions in the talk, but they are important definitions. So um, let's see. So the most important definition when you do computation with algebra, or one of the most important definitions, is that of a polynomial ring. So it's just a set of polynomials in formal variables, t1 to tn, with complex coefficients. So you can add them in a similar polynomial, you can multiply them, and this is a vector space over C, this infinite demand dimension. So if, if you want, you can think about this as the dual to feature space, which uh, is, is known in kernel learning. Um, so, um, if you put into your variable the data, you will somehow... Uh, so, so basically this is dual. And in kernel space, you are also looking at linear spaces, so the advantage of the kernel formalism is that you can linearize problems which are non-linear. And a similar phenomenon um, is present here in the algebra framework. So, an ideal is a subvector space of this polynomial ring. So it's a linear structure, but it has a multiplicative symmetry structure. So it's closed under multiplication with any elements from the polynomial ring. So in this example, we will mirror those symmetries, which are clearly um, non-linear since you multiply and you can also do different things by transforming our problem to an ideal in the polynomial ring which is linear but which additionally has this multiplicative closeness which we can exploit in an algorithm. So and an ideal you can see it as a generalization of a vector space to the polynomial ring where you have these multiplicative symmetries and you have a like in vector spaces, you have generation of vector spaces by elements, so you can efficiently represent them and you can calculate with them. There's a whole theory about of it, which is uh, called computational algebra. And uh, so just keep these two structures in mind, the polynomial ring, the domain, where we will be performing calculations and um, the idea which mirrors the structure of a particular problem. Okay, so there's an intricate correspondence between geometric objects on the one side, so algebraic geometric objects, for example, lines, spheres, or the set of solutions in our case, and these um, um, structures on the algebra side. So the polynomial ring somehow corresponds to the C to the N, but it also has all this nonlinear structure in it because the CN is finitely dimensional, the, the right thing is infinity dimensional, so it has some 
more structure. And this is a general phenomenon on the algebra side. You have mo more what you do not see on the geometry side, which there remains hidden probably in nonlinearity. So for a point, a, a point is encoded so what the, but, but by, by what is called the geometry algebra duality by uh, the ideal. So the polynomials just say, okay, the coordinate T1 is alpha 1 for this point. And so you assign values to all coordinates, and this is encoded in.